Waves and sound and the disappointing universal wave equation. You're going to be able to use the universal wave equation to compute speed, frequency, and lambda. You'll amaze your friends and attract other people. The equation is as ridiculously simple as you could imagine. It's so disappointing in physics and math when you hear the universal equation or the fundamental and you think, whoo, 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 this is going to be so important. It's going to be like some epical, earth-shattering mysteries of the universe unfolding event. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint. It's just speed equals distance over time with different pants on. The length of a wave is lambda. That's D. Ba bum. Time is the period of the wave. Ba bum. That's the universal wave equation. Ooh. And that will convert to that form too. That's the same equation we started the course with. We just put different pants on it. Call it lambda. Call it F. Now, when we work with speed, it's usually the speed of sound. And here we don't get the choice we got with vehicles. Like the acceleration due to gravity, sometimes certain values come built into the environment. The speed of sound is highly temperature and density dependent in gases. Here are a few typical values we can look at. And for air, it turns out there's a little empirical formula. 330 plus 0.6 T with time in Celsius will adjust for air temperature. And that empirical formula was actually came up by a Canadian science teacher um, a number of years ago, like before I was born kind of thing. So when we say a plane is going Mach 1, we mean the speed of sound, but the mach meter inside the plane is not like a speedometer. It's not just like measuring speed. It has to take into account all sorts of other variables and compute the local speed of sound on the conditions of the plane. And this is the plane emerging from a giant rarefaction where the air suddenly expands, the density drops, the temperature drops, and you get this condensation disk in the air. Before we continue, we're going to be talking about A4. And what we don't mean is the Audi A4. We're talking about the piano A4, which is 440 hertz on the piano key. It's the fourth octave. So the A way over here, uh, buried at the bottom right there, that would be like A3. Sorry, there's A3, there's A2, A1 is just off the screen, okay? So let's take an example. We'll get Lurch here playing the harpsichord from a long, long time ago. And we're going to work out the wavelength of his harpsichord. So he's playing A4, 440 hertz. How long are the waves in air? And we assume the temperature is 20 degrees. What is the wavelength underwater? Let's carry out the two calculations. Step one, we compute the speed in air using that empirical formula, meaning the guy just modeled it so you could avoid the university level math, and we get 342 meters per second. Since speed is F lambda, and lambda equals V over F, then in this case, we get 342 meters a second over 440 hertz, and we get a sound wavelength of 0.77 meters. So pretty much, that would be about from his chest to the sheet music he's looking at, um, almost a meter between compressions. We're going to do the water part now. So here's the part we just did. And for water, the only change is going to be a fixed speed. We don't bother with temperature and pressure of water and speed. And we work out uh, that the V over F is now slightly different number for speed. Well, a monstrously different number. And underwater, the spacing of the waves would be much, much wider because the speed is moving faster. So you got to remember, whatever's making the sound is vibrating, like a little bug lying on the water and it's kicking its legs and it's making ripples. If the ripples move fast, they will spread out really rapidly between leg kicks on the, on the bug. So it makes sense that the sound travels in water because it's traveling faster. The waves get a chance to spread out a lot further. Now we go back to a what I call a suddenly stupid example. A ship is torpedoed three kilometers away from a fisherman and a scuba diver immediately under his boat. Who hears the explosion first? And how much sooner do they hear it? 
you probably initially think, oh no, how does the universal wave equation work here? But just like learning d equals vit plus half at squares suddenly makes you stupid and you forget d equals v average t. So when we teach you v equals f lambda, all of a sudden it's like you never learned speed is equal to distance over time before. It's a strange phenomenon. I suffered from it when I was younger. You will suffer from it. I, it's something to do with we, we figure what we were just taught must be the thing that needs to be applied. This will just break into two simple problems that you could have done the first day of this course. We just rearrange v equals distance over time to time is equal to distance over v. And we take the 3000 meters to the boat, we take the speed of sound that we calculated in an earlier problem, and we get about nine seconds for the fishermen to hear that boat explosion. And when we try it in water, the only difference now is two seconds. So there's a seven second lead for the scuba diver. He could like do something dramatic in a movie like hear the detonation come flying up, grab his friend off the boat, pull him into the water so he isn't hit by shrapnel, but then he's drowned his friend and he's going, no! Lightning strike. Here's a classic question. You see a flash of lightning on a 30 degree day. It takes four seconds for the sound to reach you. How far away is that lightning? First step is calculate the speed of sound. Bingo! Second step, the time for sound in air. Well, not the time for sound in air. Given the time of sound in air for four seconds, we get 1,392 meters. So it's a lie. The old count for one second was one mile when I was a kid. And then later on in life, you'll see every second is a kilometer. It's not even close. One, two, three, four is a kilometer and a half. It's not moving a kilometer or a mile every second. And you can tell these rules of thumb are fake because, like I said, when I was a kid, I was told every second you count is a mile. Then suddenly it switched around grade eight. Every second you count is a kilometer. And you're like, you're just making this up because your rule of thumb didn't change when you changed the units. And that's how you can start spotting a uh, potential, uh, I'm not so certain what I've just been taught is correct. Another thing that you see in movies, everybody hears the bullet that kills them. Gunfire is heard instantly, no matter how far away the gun is, except in the movie Tremors. There's definitely sound delay on that. Uh, there is no sound in outer space, except in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey and Interstellar. They got rid of sound in space. So do you hear the bullet that kills you? Well, let's take the record kill. It's the three of the top five sniper shots in history are Canadian. The most recent was 3,540 meters in Iraq on a weapon that is sighted to only 1,800 meters. So he exceeded twice the performance specs of the weapon. The Canadian soldier had a Macmillan TAC-50, uh, like, large elephant-killing gun. Look at the size of the TAC-50 bullet here. This is the bullet he was using there, okay? These are your standard, ordinary army soldier rifle bullet. So he had a big bullet, and that's a muzzle velocity of 805 meters a second. How long would it take the bullet to reach his target, and how long for the sound to reach the target? Once again, we're back to the equation from our first day in the course. The bullet flight time is going to be the distance divided by the bullet speed. And we get just under five seconds. So if the target was looking towards this soldier, when he pulled the trigger, if you saw the muzzle flash, you would have almost five seconds to grab someone you didn't like and pull them in front of you as a human shield before you were hit. So that range is impressive, plus you got a five second delay, like you, you'd have time to get up and take a drink of water before you saw the guy get hit. Now what about the sound? The sound is crawling a lot slower than the bullet. And it turns out the sound is almost 10 seconds. 
So you don't hear that which killed you. You received the bullet in your skull because it was a headshot. And five seconds later, you hear the tiniest echo across the battlefield. Yeah, at any distant, decent range, you're not going to hear the gun that killed you. Here is another head scratcher caused by, again, what I call most recent itis. You want to keep using formulas you just learned and you forget about the ones you learned in the past. A three meter long wave travels at 600 meters per second. What is its frequency? Here's the problem we have. We have three formulas solving for velocity, but they're all the same. Distance over time is the same as distance over time is the same as distance over time. That's all frequency is. And it causes students to start going, oh, eh, which one do I pick? These are all variants on the same basic concept. Since I gave you frequency, then you're probably going to use this version. But the fact is, as long as you know speed is distance over time, you can just go, oh, three meters, that's the wavelength. Uh, speed, that's that. Uh, frequency is uh, per second. That's the time one. Don't let rearranged versions of the same equation make you think you have something new. So again, find the variables you're interested in. And it's that one. Rearrange to solve for F and we get 200 per second. 200 cycles per second or 200 hertz. Wavelength difference. A 440 hertz ray wave is played above ground and below water. What is the ratio of the wavelength of these sounds? Well, we already did one in water earlier, and there's only a slight change here. And we got about three and a half meters. In air, at a much slower speed, we get 0.79 meters. By asking what is the ratio of the wavelength in these sounds, a lot of students will just like hang up and go, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I don't know how to do it. Well, in order to get a ratio of two numbers, you have to compute the two numbers. So the final question is, what's the ratio? And you just divide 3.4 over 0.79. Now, since it didn't say which way to do it, some of you would have done 0.79 divided by 3.4. But you would have got, it's four times faster in water or it's four times uh, it's four times longer in water, four times shorter in air. And lo and behold, that's exactly the ratio of the speeds. No, no big deal there. If the speed of sound is twice as big in one material, then the wavelengths will become twice as big. Sonar, your classic submarine problem. It stands for sound, navigation, and ranging. And its most basic function is to get the range to a target. But we're going to see it can do way more than that. Given a speed of sound of 1,500 meters a second, a ping is sent out for a sub and returns four seconds later. How far away is the target, and what is the wavelength of its 600 hertz, 1,600 hertz ping? Now, the range to the target is easy. Just distance is V times T. The thing that's moving is the sound wave, 1,500 meters a second for four seconds. The sound wave traveled for 6,000 meters. Now, I said the ping came back after four seconds. This is a there and back trip. So the wave went to the target and came back to you. So the enemy sub is 3,000 meters away. In terms of the wavelength, we would choose any one of these formulas here that has lambda in it. And we get lambda is equal to V over F, put in our numbers, and the wavelength of the sonar is 0.94.